conventional spirituality. And this stage of spirituality often begins with the teaching of, of, of children by their parents or their churches, given spiritual principles and values. Now, this spirituality is attached to specific forms or beliefs that have been taught and must be believed or followed. Specific forms, specific uh, rules, spe specific formulas that must be followed. And, um, and this, he says, is the, the spirituality of most churchgoers and believers today. And uh, you can always tell those individuals, you know, I, I see them in MCC. We come into MCC from so many different traditions. We have a mental map of what church is like. And many of us are in that second stage of spirituality. And if it's not like the church we came from, it's not really church because it has to be correct. That's the way we were taught. Well, the third stage is questioning spirituality. There comes that moment when we may start to question things. And at this stage, people question beliefs and they engage their doubts. Dr. Peck says if people advance in this stage, they often become active truth seekers. Doubting and raising questions are very important steps to spiritual growth. Let me say that one more time. It is so important. Doubting and asking questions are important steps to spiritual growth. And then the ultimate stage of spiritual growth is what, it, what, is, what I would describe as integrated spirituality. Dr. Peck describes it as mystic spirituality because he says at this point, people begin to be willing to embrace the mystery of their spirituality. It is a more mellow kind of faith where you don't have to have an answer for every question. You can live with the questions. You can respect the spiritual beliefs and practices of others different from your own. And you can live with the questions because you are secure in your awareness of God's presence and God's love in your life. God is always there. My pastor at the Sunshine Cathedral, Reverend Durrell Watkins, has a saying he says to us over and over and over again. He says, there's not a spot where God is not. I like that. That is what I've come to believe in my spirituality. And you know, when I came into MCC, I had to move from that stage two to that stage three where I began to doubt and ask some questions. And I discovered when I was able to ask myself one question, I allowed myself the right to ask one question about my church's teaching, and that was around my sexual orientation. When I gave myself the right to ask that one question, it brought to me the responsibility to start asking other questions. And that started me on a lifelong journey that has made my life richer, fuller, and so much more whole. I could be honest with myself and engage the questions, and some questions I still live with. And that moves, that just gets us moving into a more mature spirituality. Now the reality is that people here today are at very different places on their spiritual journey. You may have questions or you may have doubts about your faith today, and let me tell you right now, that's a good thing. It is a vital step to your spiritual growth. The second lesson that I've learned is that not only is uh, salvation a journey, salvation is also a lifestyle. The early Christians called it the way. Look at the way that Jesus lived and taught. One of his most famous teachings and sermons was called the Sermon on the Mount. You can read it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5 through 7. And there Jesus repeatedly says, you have heard it said, he's talking about the scripture, but I say to you, and then he gives a different take on things. And a good example of that is his, his take on the ancient law of retaliation. Listen to this. Uh, Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, 
do not resist the evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In 1982, I visited Israel for the very first time. And at the time that this small MCC group of 18 people went to Israel, Israel was engaged in a war with Lebanon and Syria. And uh, one, as we spent our first evening in the hotel in Jerusalem, the next morning we were to go up to Nazareth and then on into the area of Galilee in the north of Israel. And early in the morning, our tour guide came to us and said, well, we're not going to be able to go to Nazareth today. A riot broke out, and so we're going to have to go. We'll be delayed and have to go another route. But then within the hour, he came back and said, well, the police and the military have, have controlled the riot, so we will get to go to Nazareth after all. And so we went to Nazareth and saw the birth, or, you know, the home of Jesus and, the, um, and where he grew up. And then we went on into north to Galilee, to the western, uh, it's a town on the western shore of Galilee, Tiberias. And so we were in our hotel high on the hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee. And we had dinner and we went out in the courtyard in the evening time. And while several of us were gathered in the courtyard sitting there talking, two young Arab men, probably in their early 20s, came to introduce themselves to us and join in our conversation. And as it turned out, those two young men were from Nazareth. And then they, be, they proceeded to tell us about the riot that day. And what had happened was that there was a woman who lived in the Jewish quarter of the city, and she had one only son, one only child. Her son was in the military and had been killed that week in, uh, in Lebanon. And so she got, became very angry and very hysterical a couple of, of Arab gardeners were working in her garden. She got a gun and she shot them to death. And that started the riot. And so at this point, one of the young men says to our group, uh, he, he said, you know, we'll strike back. Uh, he said, we'll teach them a lesson and we'll drive them into the sea. And I thought to myself as I sat there silently, young man, do you not know that 2,000 years ago there was another man, young man just like you from your village, and he said that retaliation never wins? Hatred never works? For thousands of years, no one has been learning this lesson. Retaliation continues, and the hatred only gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And Jesus came and said, I will show you another way. We live in a world that seeks power and strength, seeks strength and wealth and power through competition and aggression and retaliation. But our lifestyle, the way of Jesus Christ, finds its strength in love in forgiveness, in compassion, and in generosity. When we follow Christ, our lifestyle works passionately for justice through nonviolence. It is a great tragedy that so many people who consider themselves Christians today so often do not choose the lifestyle taught and lived by Jesus Christ. But folks, there's a great opportunity for us here today by learning and living this lifestyle in our relationships, in our congregation, in our community, we can be a witness to the world. We can be the presence of the risen Jesus Christ in this congregation, in this community, and in our world. Salvation is a lifestyle. And third, and this is good news, Salvation is eternal. As long as I live, I will be in the process of being saved. And the day will come when I will die. And my salvation will continue in another life. Let me share with you a story of a woman who touched my life so deeply while I was the pastor of the MCC in Dallas. Her name was Sini Miller. Sini and her partner Maggie came to MCC shortly after Sini was diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
And in the face of her diagnosis with a terminal illness, Sini found a very deep hunger for God. And it seemed like she was in our church every time the doors were open, at every worship service, at every prayer meeting, at every Bible class, C was there and right in the middle of things. And when the church was not open, you could probably find her on the parking lot fixing the cars of some of the guys because she was a great mechanic. Sini <laughs> was very proud of her identity as a Texas dyke. And Maggie was always there too, singing in the choir. Well, the cancer got worse, and as the end drew closer, Sini was in the hospital again just before Christmas, and we knew that would be the last time. And one Saturday afternoon, I went to the hospital, and I went to Sini's room, and she was sitting in a chair, and she said, Pastor, come and sit with me and take my hands. And I took her hands, and she said, I want to pray. And Sini began to pray. And she said, my hands are everlasting. My lips are everlasting. My heart is everlasting. My eyes are everlasting. And I could just feel the presence of God's spirit fill that room, of God's love, of God's eternal love surrounding us. And I thought, my God, you're going to take her right now. Well, God didn't. And that was Saturday. And Sunday afternoon, I got a call. Come to the hospital immediately. Sini's dying. And I rushed to the hospital. And I went in the front door of the hospital. And they were putting up a big Christmas tree. And the nurses were up on a ladder trying to put an angel up in the top. And there in a wheelchair, Sini was supervising the nurses. <laughs> and I thought, they told me she was dying. And after they finished getting the angel on the tree, I wheeled Sini in her wheelchair to a little cove in the hallway where we had a window facing the west, and the sun was setting, and Sini there, and I sat there and talked, and Sini talked about how good God had been to her and how blessed she, she was to be a part of MCC. And we had a good time there. I wheeled her back to her room, she went to bed that night, and as was every night, Maggie would sit beside her in the chair, and Maggie told us uh, Monday morning that about four in the morning, Sini woke up and woke up Maggie and said, Maggie, get up, come up and lay on this bed beside me. And so she crawled up on the bed beside Maggie, or, C or Maggie crawled up on the bed beside Sini, and sat there for a while, and she said, all of a sudden, Sini just sat straight up, and she looked up, and she lifted her hands, and she said, oh, Maggie, it's beautiful. And she fell back down, and absent from this body, Sini was present with Christ. Amen. The next Sunday, we celebrated Sini's life and God's goodness, and we celebrated the hope of the risen Christ. And Maggie sang in the choir. And the congregation rejoiced knowing that Sini was still with us in that eternal cloud of witness that Hebrews chapter 12 talks about. Do you know today that God has good things planned for you? God wants you to be in a permanent relationship. God wants your life to be filled with an abundance of blessings. Folks, together... We can find a place of growth on a journey to completeness. We can learn the way of Jesus Christ to bring harmony into our congregation, into our community, and into our world. And ultimately, we can embrace God's promise of eternal life. This is salvation. Shalom.
wonder if you'd allow me to be a little serious this morning, if you just bear with me. And normally, you expect me to make you laugh. We're in a um, time of transition at Founders. It's summertime. People are gone. They're out of town. And right now, our ties and offerings are down significantly. And I'm simply going to ask you to give as you normally do, and if you can, to give even more. We have great things to do yet. We have to find a permanent leader, and that's going to take everybody's effort in time and money. So please give generously. Thank you. creator who has offered us salvation 
this process to go through our life and this place to, where we can do it together. I pray that you bless this congregation and you bless these gifts, these offerings, and these tithes, and may we use them for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is the time that we ask our online worshipers to go if they would like and get something in their home to represent the elements, perhaps cookies or crackers or uh, juice. Um, it really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, the only suggestion I have to the online viewers is if you haven't cleaned out your refrigerator like I have in a while, if you open your refrigerator and something walks out, do not use that for communion. So that's my only suggestion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good suggestion, yes. Um, in the Celtic tradition, which I'm a part of, we have a belief that where the earth and the heaven meets is in the heart. And I think for me, this table has always been the heart of worship. And I think also with Don, I now think of it as the, the table of shalom. Yes. So what I'd like to invite us is to take a moment just to reflect before I go into the prayer of ways that we need to recalibrate our heart as we go on our way of salvation, however that way may look. So let's take a moment before we go into prayer together of thinking of ways that we may need to recalibrate things that separate us from God, things that separate us from each other, and things that separate us from our very self. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for this time at this table. Help us to find our way, your way of salvation and all the many ways that we interpret that to be. Thank you for the example of Sini, the Texas Dyke. And thank you also for the witness of Bill Hooper, who we grieve this morning. Help us all to find salvation in all the ways and to find salvation for ourselves, for this church, and for this world, and to bring it outside these doors. And if I claim, in the name of Christ, that man from Nazarene, amen. amen. <laughs> On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, <coughs> broke it, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. For this is my body, which is broken for all of you. In a like manner, he took the cup, raised it up, gave thanks and praise, passed the cup around and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the blood that is given for all for the remission of sins. All I ask is that you do this in memory of me. Pray. Pray. Okay. God, I ask that you come into these elements these elements and to bring to us the presence of Christ in all the different ways that we interpret this meal. Help us to not only bring your presence, Christ, from these elements into our heart, but also to take our hearts, your heart, into the world. And I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Do you want to? You're working me today. Um, so for new timers, 
you're probably nervous. There's actually something in the bulletin about how to do communion, and we're actually going to have the ushers help you as well. So while you're reading what's in the bulletin, I want to talk to the people who've heard this a million times before. Mm -hmm. And just say, remember that when we come up to this radical, this table of radical hospitality, this table of shalom, that we are actually going to be taking it out into the world. So you're coming here, putting the risen Christ in you and taking it out. And think how radical that is. Now back to the new timers. So don't worry. What happens is we take and we give by what's often called the method of intinction, where we'll take the host, the wafer, dip it, place it on your tongue, and then do a blessing. If you want that different in any way, please let your server know. If you also want to have just the elements yourself, just between you and God, there will be elements over on the table on the other side of the signer. And what else have I forgotten? That's it? Follow the ushers. Oh, yes. Very important. Camille has a very good point. Follow the ushers. At this time, will the, altars, uh, will the uh, acolytes and servers please come forward?
Thank you all for being here together in worship at Founders MCC today on this beautiful Sunday. And my prayer is that throughout this week ahead, you will experience the abundance of God's presence and may the joy of our God be your strength. And now may peace and joy abide with each one in the name of God, our Creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Guide. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. By participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry. Wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. Please connect with us and interact with us by telephone, email, or social media. Be an angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donations.